Chapter 15, King Edeleg. Down he spun, battling for air in a flood that broke upon him like a crumbling mountain. Faster and faster, the waters bore him along, tossing him right and left. Terran collided with something. What it was, he could not tell, but he clung to it even as his strength failed him. There was a crash, as though the earth had split asunder. The water turned to foam, and Terran felt himself dashed against an unyielding wall. He remembered nothing more. When he opened his eyes, he was lying on a hard, smooth surface, his hand tightly gripping Fluter's harp. He heard the rush of water close by. Cautiously, he felt around him. His fingers touched only wet, flat stone, an embankment of some kind. A pale blue light shone high above him. Terran decided he had come to rest in a cave or grotto. He raised himself, and his movement set the harp to jangling. Hello? Who's that? A voice echoed down the embankment. Faint as though it was, Terran recognized it as belonging to the bard. He scrambled to his feet and crept in the direction of the sound. On the way, he tripped over a form, which became suddenly vocal and indignant. You've done very well, Terran of Care Dalbin, with all your shortcuts. What's left of me is soaked to the skin, and I can't find my bob. Oh, here it is. All wet, of course. And who knows what's happened to the rest of us? The golden light flared dimly to reveal the dripping face of Islandwe, her blue eyes flashing with vexation. Gurgi's hairy, sputtering shadow rolled toward him. Oh, poor tender head is filled with sloshings and washings. In another moment, Fluter had found them. Melangar whinnied behind him. I thought I, I thought I heard my harp down here, he said. I couldn't believe it at first. Never expected to see it again. But a flam never despairs. Quite a stroke of luck, though. I never thought I'd see anything again, Terran said, handing the instrument to Fluter. We've been washed into a cave of some kind, but it's not a natural one. Look at these flagstones. If you'd look at Melangar Island, we called, you'd see all our provisions are gone. All our weapons, too, thanks to your precious shortcut. It was true. The straps had broken loose and the saddle had torn away in the whirlpool. Luckily, the companions still had their swords. I'm sorry, Terran said. I admit we're here through my fault. I should not have followed this path, but what's done is done. I let us here and I'll find a way out. He glanced around. The roar of water came from a wide, swift-running canal. The embankment itself was much broader than he had realized. Lights of various colors glowed in the high arches. He turned to see his companions again. This is very curious. They seem to be deep underground, but it isn't the lake bottom. Before he could utter another word, he was seized from behind, and a bag smelling strongly of onions was jammed over his head. Island we screamed, and then her voice grew muffled. Terran was being half pushed, half pulled in two directions at once. Gurgi began yelping furiously. Here, get that one, a gruff voice shouted. Get him yourself. Can't you see I've got my hands full? Terran struck out. A solid round ball that must have been someone's head butted him in the stomach. There were slapping noises filtering through the oniony darkness around him. Those would be from Island Week. Now he was pushed from behind, propelled at top speed, while angry voices shouted at him and at each other. How's the little one there? You fool, you didn't take their swords! At this came another shriek from Island Week, the sound of what might have been a kick, then a moment of silence. Oh, all right, let him keep their swords. You'll have the blame of it, better than approach King Edelig with weapons. At a blind trot, Terran was shoved through what seemed to be a large crowd of people. Everyone was talking at once. The noise was deafening. After a number of turns, he was thrust forward again. A heavy door snapped behind him. The onion bag was snatched from his head. Terran blinked. With Fluter and Islandwee, he stood in the center of a high-vaulted chamber, glittering with lights. Gurgi was nowhere in sight. Their captors were half a dozen squat, round, stubby-legged warriors. Axes hung from their belts, and each man had a bow and quiver of arrows on his shoulder. The left eye of the short, burly fellow who stood beside Islandwee was turning greenish-black. Before them, at a long stone table, a dwarfish figure with a bristling yellow beard glared at the warriors. He, roll a, he, roll or, ugh, he wore a robe of garish red and green. Rings sparkled on his plump fingers. What's this, he shouted. Who are these people? Didn't I give orders I wasn't to be disturbed? But majesty, began one of the warriors shifting uneasily. We caught them. Must you bother me with details? King Adelaide cried, clasping his forehead. You ruined me. You'll be the death of me. Out, out! 
No, not the prisoners, you idiots. Shaking his head, sighing and sputtering, the king collapsed onto a throne carved from rock. The guards scurried away. King Edeling shot a furious glance at Terran and his companions. Now then, out with it. What do you want? You might as well know ahead of time you shan't have it. Sire, Terran began, we ask no more than safe passage through your realm. The four of us, there's only three of you. King Edeling snapped. Can't you count? One of my companions is missing, Terran said regretfully. He had hoped Gurgi would have overcome his fear, but he could not blame the creature for running off after his ordeal in the whirlpool. I beg your servants to help us find him. Then, too, our provisions and weapons have been lost. That's clotted nonsense, shouted the king. Don't lie to me. I can't stand it. He pulled an orange kerchief from his sleeve and mopped his forehead. Why did you come here? Because an assistant pig keeper led us on a wild goose chase, I only interrupted. We don't even know where we are, let alone why. It's worse than rolling downhill in the dark. Naturally, said Adeleg, his voice dripping with sarcasm. You have no idea you're in the very heart of the kingdom of Twilith Tag, the fair folk, the happy family, the little people, or whatever other insipid, irritating names you put on us. Oh, no, of course not. You just happen to be passing by. We were caught in the lake, Terran protested. It pulled us down. Good, eh? King Adeleg answered with a quick smile of pride. I've added some improvements of my own, of course. If you're so anxious to keep visitors away, Island, we said, you should have something better to make people stay out. When people that this close, Adeleg answered, they're already too close. At that point, I don't want them out. I want them in. Fluter shook his head. I always understood the fair folk were all over Prydain, not just here. Of course, not just here, said Adelaide with impatience. This is the royal seat. Why, we have tunnels and mines every place you could imagine. But the real work, the real label of organization is here, right here, in this very spot, in this very throne room, on my shoulders. It's too much, I tell you, too much. But who else can you trust? If you want something done right... The king stopped suddenly and drummed his glittering fingers on the stone table. That's not your affair, he said. You're in trouble enough as it is. Can't be overlooked. I don't see any work being done, said Islandby. Before Taryn could warn Islandby not to be imprudent, the door of the storm room burst open and a crowd of folk pressed in. Looking closer, Taryn saw not all were dwarfs. Some were tall, slender, with white robes. Others were covered with glistening scales like fish. Still others fluttered large, delicate wings. For some moments, Terran heard nothing but a confusion of voices, angry outcries and bickering, with Edeling trying to shout above them. Finally, the king managed to push them all out again. No work being done, he cried. You don't appreciate everything that goes into it. The children of evening, that's another ridiculous name you humans have thought of, are to sing in the forest of Cantor of Maw tonight. They haven't even practiced. Two are sick and one can't be found. The lake sprites have been pouring all day and they're sulking. Their hair's a mess. And who does that reflect on? Who has to jolly them along? Coax them? Plead with them? The answer is obvious. What thanks do I get for it? King Adelaide ranted on. None at all. Has any of you long-legged gawks ever taken the trouble? Even once, mind you. They're all for the simplest expression of gratitude. Such as, thank you, King Adelaide, for the tremendous effort and inconvenience you've gone to, so we can enjoy a little charm and beauty in the world above, which would be so unspeakably grim without you and your fair folk. Just a few words of honest appreciation. By no means, just the opposite. If any of you thick skulled oaks come out on one of the fair folk above ground, what happens? You seize them. You grab them with your great hammy hands and try to make them lead you to buried treasure. Or you squeeze them until you get three wishes out of them. Not satisfied one. Oh no. Three. Well, I don't mind telling you this. Adelaide went on, his face turning better by the moment. I've put an end to all this wish granting, treasure scavenging. No more. Absolutely not. I'm surprised you didn't ruin this long ago. Just then a chorus of voices rose from behind the door to Adelaide's throne room. The harmonies penetrated even the walls of heavy stone. Taran had never in his life heard such beautiful singing. He listened enchanted, forgetting for the moment all but the soaring melody. 
Edleg himself stopped shouting and puffing until the voices died away. That's something to be thankful for, the king said at last. The children of evening have evidently got together again. Not as good as you might want, but they'll manage somehow. I have not heard the song of their fair folk until now, Terran said. I never realized how lovely they were. Don't try to flatter me, Adelaide cried, trying to look furious, yet beaming at the same time. What surprises me, Ilan, we said, while the bard plucked meditatively at his harp, trying to recapture the notes of the song, is why you go to so much trouble. If you fair folk dislike all of us above ground, why do you bother? Professional pride, my dear girl, said the dwarf king, putting a chubby hand to his heart and bowing slightly. When we fair folk do something, we do it right. Oh, yes, he sighed. Never mind the sacrifices we make. It's a task that needs doing, and so we do it. Never mind the cost. For myself, he added with a wave of his hand, it doesn't matter. I've lost sleep, I've lost weight, but that's not important. The King Edelic had lost weight, Terran thought to himself. What might he have been like beforehand? He decided against asking this question. Well, I appreciate it, Ilan, he said. I think it's amazing what you've been able to do. You must be extremely clever, and any assistant pig keepers who happen to be in this throne room might do well to pay attention. Thank you, dear girl, said the King Adelig, bowing lower. I see you're the sort of person one can talk to intelligently. It's unheard of for one of you big shambling louts to have any kind of insight into these matters, but you at least seem to understand the problems we face. Sire, interrupted Taryn, we understand your time is precious. Let us disturb you no more. Give us safe conduct, Care Daffle. What? shouted King Edeling. Leave here? Impossible. Unheard of. Once you're with the fair folk, my good lad, you stay. And no mistake about it. Oh, I suppose I could stretch a point for the sake of the young lady and let you off easily. Only put you to sleep for fifty years or turn you all into bats. But that would be a pure favor, mind you. Our task is urgent, Terran cried. Even now we have delayed too long. That's your concern, not mine, Edelig shrugged. Then we shall make our own way, Terran shouted, drawing his sword. Fluter's blade leaped out and the bard stood with Terran, ready to fight. More clotted nonsense, King Edelig said, looking contemptuously at the swords pointed toward him. He shook his fingers at them. There, and there. Now you might try and move your arms. Terran strained every muscle. His body felt turned to stone. Put your swords away, and let's talk this over calmly, said the dwarf king, gesturing again. If you give me any decent reason why I should let you go, I might think it over and answer you promptly and say, in a year or two. There could be no use, Terran saw, in concealing the reasons for his journey. He explains to Edelig what had befallen them. The dwarf king ceased his blustering at the mention of Aaron, but when Terran had finished, King Edelig shook his head. This is a conflict you great gawks must attend to yourselves. The fair folk owe you no allegiance, he said angrily. Poor dame belonged to us before the race of men came. You drove us underground. You plundered our mine, you blundering clodpoles. You stole our treasures and you keep on stealing them, you clumsy oafs. Sire, Terran answered. I can speak for no man but myself. I have never robbed you and I have no wish to. My task means more to me than your treasures. If there is ill will between the fair folk and the race of men, then it is a matter to be settled between them. But if the horned king triumphs, if the shadow of Anovan falls in the land above you, Aaron's hand will reach to your deepest caverns. For an assistant or pig keeper, said Adelaide, you're reasonably eloquent. But the fair folk will worry about Aaron when the time comes. The time has come, Terran said. I only hope it has not passed. I don't think you really know what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't think you really know what's going on above ground, Ilan, we suddenly exclaimed. You talk about charm and beauty and sacrificing yourself to make things pleasant for people. I don't believe you care a bit for that. You're too conceited and stubborn and selfish. Conceited, shouted Edelig, his eyes popping. Selfish? You won't find anyone more open-hearted and generous. How dare you say that? What do you want, my life's blood? With that, he tore off his cloak and threw it in the air, pulled the rings from his fingers and tossed them in every direction. Go ahead. Take it all. Leave me ruined. What else do you want, my whole kingdom? Do you want to leave? 
go by all means. The sooner the better. Stubborn, I'm too soft. It'll be the death of me, but little do you care. At that moment, the door to the throne room burst open again. Two dwarf warriors clung frantically to Gurgi, who swung them about as if they were rabbits. Joyous greetings! Faithful Gurgi is back with mighty heroes! This time, valiant Gurgi did not run, oh no, no! Brave Gurgi fought with great whackings and smackings. He triumphed, but then mighty lords were carried away. Clever Gurgi goes seeking and peeking to save them, yes! And he finds them. But that is not all. Faithful, honest, fearless Gurgi finds more. Surprises and delights so oh joy. Gurgi was so excited he began dancing on one foot, spinning around and clapping his hands. Mighty warriors, go to seek a piggy. It is clever, wise Gurgi who finds her. And when, cried Taran, where is she? Here, mighty lord, Gurgi shouted. The piggy is here. 